theoretically, theoretically um, is it possible to have inflation here within Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies? And in that scenario, what would that look like? Well, uh, Bitcoin currently runs at a rate of inflation of about five percent. It used to be closer to twelve. It's gone down over time because if you think about it, fifty new Bitcoin were being generated every ten minutes, and there wasn't enough demand in the economy to absorb that. So it had an inflationary effect. Right. Now, as the reward diminishes over time, that inflation rate gets closer to zero. Uh, and that becomes negative. It becomes a deflationary currency, which simulates a very scarce, rare system like gold, uh, which is part of the design characteristics of Bitcoin. But not all open public blockchains have that. Other open public blockchains have more inflationary monetary policies. You can do any policy you want. You can have a monetary policy that is very inflationary. You can have a monetary policy that is not inflationary at all. You can have a monetary policy that is so inflationary that you have 4,000 percent inflation a month. We call that Zimbabwe. <laughs> Would you? Okay, follow up. Would be a good idea, but you can do it. With all these cryptocurrencies, okay, now emerging here on the horizon, okay, would you? Is there a possibility for there to be any currency war that we see okay, in the actual world right now? Um. Yeah. Well. Um, whether they like it or not, digital currencies are part of the currency wars. And the reason they're part of the currency wars is because they did the unthinkable. They gave people a choice to exit the currency wars. <laughs> that's, the, that's the worst thing you could do during a currency war. Um, so, for example, um, in some places like Venezuela, it is highly illegal to have or use Bitcoin. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, as soon as the government says that something is highly illegal and cannot be used, everybody stops using it immediately. <laughs> the use of cryptocurrencies in Venezuela quadrupled. And it's a really simple idea. You have a family, you need to feed your family. Your government is giving you money that is worth nothing, and is worth more than nothing, or less than nothing tomorrow, and much less than nothing the day after. Or you can use this cryptocurrency, which is highly illegal, but can feed your family. You're going to be a highly criminal feeder of your family. That's how humans make decisions. And you're going to break one more stupid law by, by one more crazy government. Um, so the currency wars are happening because, in many places, governments are failing in their role of delivering the fundamental functions of currency. You see, most of us don't ever need to worry about currency. Currency is one of those things that, when it's working, you can ignore it completely. It becomes invisible. It's the fabric of society. You don't even know that it's a technology. I go to talks and I tell people money is a technology, and they don't understand what I'm talking about because they've never thought of it that way. It's a language. It's a technology, and it works. And when it works, you don't need to think about it at all. But when it stops working, everything fails. Everything stops working. Even the most basic of functions that worked before fall apart. So it's a very fundamental part of society. So what is the government's role in currency? Don't print too much of it, because if you print too much of it, its value goes to zero. Right? Pay the debts when they come due, so you don't default on that value. Allow it to be used and make it liquid, so that there's enough of it in the economy that the problem isn't that I can't find the currency, even though I actually have the value, right? And allow me to use it to do international trade and trade with my neighbors. Four very simple things. I can list two dozen governments that are breaking all four of those rules right now, and that's why we have currency wars, right? When a government takes out 87 percent of all of the money in circulation with four hours notice and says, oh, it's not money anymore. That's a violation of those rules. When they print a hundred trillion dollars worth of debt in the last ten years, that's a violation of those rules. That is actively stealing from your savings to pay the government debt. So when governments do that, you have currency wars. And what digital currencies do is they give people a simple choice. Until now, they had two choices. Say okay, or fight the government. Now they have a third choice, which is really powerful. It's bye-bye. <laughs> Walk away. That's one of the most powerful choices that people have. 
And when people have the choice to walk away from a mess, that makes it less likely that a mess will occur. Right? So, yes, currency wars are going to continue to happen. The difference is that now we're not talking about currency representing a nation and being tied with that national identity and the national pride and the national religion and the face of the king or the queen or the very important person. Now, currencies are constructs that can be created by anyone. May have value, may not have value, may have stable value, may have unstable value, but they're a simple choice. You can pick your currencies like you pick your mail providers, like you pick your TV shows, you can now choose. And some of them will be better for some things, and some of them will be better for other things. But importantly, no one can stop you from making that choice now. And that's a really powerful change. So it's going to change the way currency wars are being fought by giving so many people so many choices that the traditional approach doesn't work anymore. You see, when a government creates a situation where they have hyperinflation, and they have this dramatic spiral of collapse of the economy, one of the fundamental things that happens is they take the entire population hostage. They close down the borders, the country becomes a prison, and you go down with it. Right? Um, what if you can exit? That changes everything. Bitcoin is not taking a side in these currency wars. Bitcoin is going to be the Switzerland, even when Switzerland is no longer the Switzerland. <laughs> and Bitcoin will be the only Switzerland left standing, because eventually you will have gold confiscations. Modi has been very careful to keep repeating, we won't be confiscating gold. Yesterday, they announced that they're going to be doing tax audits. And in those tax audits, anything over a certain amount of gold, even if it's hanging off the neck of the married housewife in India, who are, by the way, the holders of the majority of gold in the world, they will be confiscating it and applying a 60% tax. By the way, what that actually means is that they're going to be doing spot checks on random victims. Those random victims are then going to be required to pay an enormous bribe to those very corrupt officials so they can simply walk away and corruption marches on and gets bigger and bigger. You do not take a political side in this fight. This is not about being pro-Modi or anti-Modi. It is not about being pro-Erdogan or anti-Erdogan. It's, it's about being completely neutral. Bitcoin isn't taking a political st stance here. The only political stance it's taking is individuals should control their own money.